This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise Beware the ancient Papal lie With such a cloud Of witnesses Who by grace Died in their Lord Recall their Memory to say By the same Faith we live today Hello everyone, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Joggler66 and Hour of the Truce. I'm gathered here together on this Sunday evening, the 13th of March 2016, with two brothers in Christ from over there in the United States of America. And both of them you all know because they have both been on my program already in the, uh, in the past and they probably will be also in the future. First of all, I want to introduce you to... Um, Brett Norman from Minnesota, if I'm getting that right, and the one with the wonderful, let's say, almost biblical job that he has being a carpenter. Brett, how are you doing? Great, thank you. And welcome to the broadcast. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. You're very much welcome. I'm glad to have you. Okay, and uh, my other guest is... One you very, very well know, of course. Uh, he is from Inquisition Update. He does his daily job on First Amendment Radio for the last few years, reading wonderful, wonderful Protestant and other books, always dealing with Protestantism, always dealing with protesting the Pope, which we are here, our three all together are doing. And that is Tom Fress, even also from the United States of America over there, from Inquisition Update. How are you doing, Tom? Good evening, Yerk and Brett and all of your listeners. Thanks for inviting me, and it's my pleasure and blessing to be here. It's wonderful to have you, Tom. You. We spoke a little bit yesterday evening, and you uh, told me that you finished the reading of um, Rome and Civil Liberty, the book from James Aitken Wiley, uh, during last week. Um, that was quite an effort. I think it took you about 80 broadcasts or something to go through that book. Maybe yes. you want to share with our listeners a little bit of your experience that you've had from there? Yes, it's a rather lengthy work, but it was only lengthy because of my added comments. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's, a very, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very valuable book, and it's a, literally a road map. Uh, uh, let me just put it this way. History is repeating itself, 
and there's no need for anyone to be uh, surprised or or uh, doubtful about what Rome is doing in the United States of America because she did it before the very same things in 1865 in Britain. And that book is written uh, of 1865, The History of Britain, and what James Aiken Wiley called the papal aggression. It was an attempt to overthrow the, the Protestant government of Great Britain and to take over the government. And uh, it's a very, very eye-opening work. It's uh, James Aiken Wiley is known as the, the, the prince of historians the prince of Protestant historius, historianism, and uh, I highly recommend the book. I most highly recommend uh, that their, your listeners tune in to uh, First Amendment Radio and avail themselves of, of all those broadcasts, some 80 broadcasts in a row, if you truly wish to know what Rome is doing in this country and the world. I remember some time ago you were doing the reading of um, the Global Vatican by Knight of Malta, Francis Rooney, who was an yes. ambassador to the, United, to the Vatican of the United States between 2005 and 2008. And I remember a brother in Christ in that time telling me that whenever you're going to listen to Tom Fress doing a reading on that book, The Global Vatican, what you're getting there is a real history lesson. Yes. I just have to add to that, after listening to the Global Vatican completely, and now, after almost, I have listened, I think, to 73 or something of these almost 80 broadcasts of Rome and Civil Liberty, <clears throat> I have to add to that, that when you combine these two books, it is an absolute history lesson, because you get the gist from, uh, first of all, when you go through Rome and civil liberty, you see how they done that, as you uh, expe uh, explained already, in the 1850s, 1860s, in, uh, in Protestant, at that time, Great Britain. And a hundred years later, in 1965, they had the Vatican Council II, and with that, they gave the starting shot to do the same over there in the United States of America. But they had right. the foundations laid already, of course, in That's centuries, right. as we know. But when you see these two books together, when you first read James Edgar Wiley warning about the papal takeover of Protestant Great Britain at that time, and then you go into reading The Global Vatican by Francis Rooney, and see how he boasts about how the Roman Catholic Church has already taken over the United States of America. You don't need any more history lesson than that. Yeah, right? that's, an, that's a very authoritative work. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Francis Rooney is a knight of Malta. He's a Vatican insider. He's not just a Roman Catholic. He's a Vatican insider and Jesuit trained to boot. And his book is constitutes, as you said, that's your word that you used. It was a boast uh, that the the Vatican controls both foreign and domestic policy for not only the United States of America but the United Nations. It's a it's it's an eye opening read. And uh, just as there was the so called papal aggression of Great Britain in 1865, there has been a papal aggression in this country almost since its founding, but it really got its official uh, recognition at Vatican Council II. Which ended 1965, which is about 100 years after oh, James A. Wiley ended his book. That's right. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church took over uh, the uh, Great Britain, uh, England at that time. Between those two books, the Vatican agenda for the world is clearly visible. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. and it's out there for everybody to see and for yeah. everybody to hear. And I can only advise my listeners to go to First Amendment Radio, to go to the archives, or even to go to the YouTube channel of First Amendment Radio, where all the readings of Tom Fress reading the Global Vatican during 2015 and in the end of 2015 up to last week, the reading of Rome and Civil Liberty by James Edkin Wiley are there. You can uh, watch the videos of that. You can just download the audios. You can do whatever you want with it. Just don't re-upload it because then you will get kicked in the butt, which is not so nice. But uh, you can listen to it and you can spread it all over where you want in Facebook and anything to make other people aware of the Roman Catholic agenda. 
But today we are here for another reason. Um, you know, like I said in the beginning, uh, I don't know if that was during the recording, otherwise I say it now. On our last hour of the truth, number 44, I was with Brett, and I started reading The Signs of the Times, uh, as you remember, that was a little series that I've read, and that dealt with the multicultural agenda and the Islamic invasion of the Muslim invasion of refugees or immigrants or however you want to call them that we're experiencing right now over here in Europe. Last year, the numbers aren't uh, very sure about it, but it is more than one and a half million refugees that came to Germany alone, a country with 82 million inhabitants and now one and a half million refugees, and they are growing in number every day coming through the Balkan route through Greece and Turkey into Europe, and they all head for Germany and Sweden. Those are the most countries they want to go into. Why do they want to go into those countries? Well, because this is the cradle of the Reformation. Scandinavia, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, and uh, yeah, Germany, I said already, Austria, uh, Austria was not in the Reformation in that way, but all the other countries that I said were really the cradle of the Reformation. And they want to install their multiculti in there and taking by that away the culture of the Europeans. And you can bet your behind that they will do the same in the United States of America. And they are already doing it, but not with that louder voice as they are doing it in Europe. Your, the target, the target of this is, and I, I know you, I know you know this. I want to make sure your listeners comprehend this. It's a direct assault on the Protestant Reformation. The object of all this, this uh, uh, race mixing and culture mixing, and uh, ethnic mixing, uh, be, uh, due to these wars, is to uh, undermine and put into minority status Protestantism. Protestantism is the target Absolutely. of all of this. Absolutely. So for today, I've chosen to read a newsletter that I received recently because Tom and I were speaking some time ago about uh, Richard Bennett from the website BereanBeacon.com, who we both uh, appreciate as a Christian brother, and uh, Tom told me that he got his newsletter from there, but he got it by letter, and I, I wanted to see if I could get that by email. So I contacted Richard uh, via his website and asked if I could get his newsletters via email, and uh, I got them. So the first newsletter that I got is one that he published on December 19, 2015. So that's only three months ago, or four months ago, not, not so very far in the past. And that newsletter deals with the Roman Church promotes Islam and accepts Islamic faith. So this goes a little bit back into the same study that I did with Science of the Times last uh, time on our broadcast on Hour of the Truth. And uh, Tom, as well as Brett and myself, we prepared a little bit by studying the newsletter that Richard Bennett put wonderfully together. And to him, all credit is due on the analysis, on the analysis that we are doing on what he's writing here, because we are not only reading what he wrote in this newsletter, but we are going also a little bit into a deeper study of that and try to analyze every facet uh, of the Islamic invasion. And surely, why is the Roman Catholic Church promoting Islam and accepting the Islamic faith? So I'm going to do a reading of this newsletter, and that will be interrupted, I hope, by a lot of comments as from Tom as well as from Brett. And without any further ado, I will start reading a little bit of this newsletter. And again, thank you very much, Brother Richard Bennett, for putting this together and giving us wonderful material to even get a little bit more notice to all the people what is going on in the world today, especially behind the scenes and what the mainstream media is not talking about, because it's always you know, not what they talk about, it's what they are leaving out. And there are a lot of things they are leaving out, as you will see when we go through this newsletter, which is, of course, on our view, based on the Bible view that we have, and that is, for all the three of us, the authorized version of 1611 of the King James Version. And with that, we have something very much in common with Richard Bennett, who has the same foundation in the face and truth and of his conscience. 
all the links that will be named in this newsletter while I'm reading, you can find in the description box of the video afterwards and you can start your own research. It is very important, my dear listener, that you understand that you don't have to believe a word that I say. You don't have to believe a word that Tom says, nor you have to believe anything that Brett says. Do your own research. And these links are provided for you to help you in that research. And when you come afterward, doing your research, coming to the conclusion that we are talking the truth, here, an hour of the truth, as the broadcast is called, then please come back, subscribe to my YouTube channel and watch out for more videos like this. But now, with, uh, without any further ado, I will start reading the newsletter from Richard Bennett's Berean Beacon, The Roman Church Promotes Islam and Accepts Islamic Faith. As huge numbers of Islamic migrants continue to stream into Europe from the Middle East, there is great concern among Western people. Nonetheless, even with this astonishing background, Pope Francis continues to pro promote Islam. Instead of warning people against the dangers they face from the onslaught of migrating Muslims from across the world, Francis has left unaddressed Islamic per persecution of Middle Eastern and African Christians and, indeed, Europeans. In fact, Pope Francis's outreach to Islam is simply an intensified, intensified application of the Roman Catholic Church's Vatican Council II teaching. I think we will surely speak about what the Vatican Council II was all about, also in the light of the so-called jubilee year that we are experiencing right now between the 30th of November 2015 and the 8th of December 2016 and what that inherits. But I have to make a little comment here after reading this few sentences from the newsletter from Richard Bennett. Tom, Pope Francis is now speaking on this subject. To me, that is a distraction. Why? Because, in my opinion, the real danger in this world is not Islam but the Antichrist of the Bible using all of his allies, of which Islam is one, to divert of himself. When people are busy fighting all the windmills the Antichrist sets up, they don't see or identify their real enemy. Could you please elaborate on that, please? Well, I would begin by saying that one of the first missions of the Jesuit order after their founding in 1773 was to make the whole world a mission field. And so the Jesuits set out as missionaries and invaded and infiltrated all the nations of the world. And what they, what they first did was to study the religions of the various nations of the world. And they came to a, 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 a least common denominator. Every religion of the world, by whatever name, you can find the, the, the worship of a male deity, a father deity, a female deity, a mother deity, and a child. And what the Jesuits have done has, secretly, what the Jesuits have done is found that lowest common denominator of all the religions of the world and say that they all have that in common a male deity, a female deity, and a child deity. And in order to promote this global, ecumenical, one-world religion, which denies the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which the Bible teaches about, it, it, it assumes that all the male deities, all the female deities, and all the child deities of all the pagan religions of the world are simply the worship of the one true God. And that everybody has their own permutation of that, of that imagined godhood. And so that forms the basis for the unification of all the world's religions and all the world's nations. There's no need for national borders anymore. There's no need for religious strife. There's only need for a global union and common understanding of, of this deity, which 
altogether sums up an abject rejection of the Creator and Jesus Christ, the one who he sent to redeem mankind. And the ecumenical movement, <clears throat> which was which was sold in the United States as a way to draw the Protestants back into the Roman Catholic Church, was really, in effect, a, a, a proposition to the world that all the world's religions would be united under the Roman Catholic Church, and that the papacy would become the prime religious or the sole religious leader of the world, and that he would orchestrate a global religion. Now, it's slowly but surely coming to the reality of, of, uh, of evangelicals in this country that ecumenism isn't what it was first cracked up to be in this country. Now, first of all, a true Bible-believing Protestant would never even attend Vatican Council II because true Bible-believing Protestantism insists that the papacy is was and always will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition of the Bible. That's what Protestantism is. It protests the Antichrist. And so any council convened by the Vatican would be taboo to a Protestant. But over uh, the last couple hundred years, what has been taught in all the evangelical churches is diametrically opposed to what all the Protestant reformers believed and taught, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. Instead, they began to teach in the Protestant seminaries that the Antichrist was a single individual that wouldn't come until the end of time, just before Christ's second return, his return. And so here, then we have what we call futurism, when true Bible-believing Christians all the way from the first century believed that the Antichrist would be that power that would come to power when the Caesars of Rome were done away with. And the power that came to being after the Caesars, after the fall of the, the so-called pagan Roman Empire, the power that rose up in that absence of the Caesars was the papacy. And then we had the Holy Roman Empire, they call it, which is just as holy as was the pagan Roman Empire. The, pa the papacy has formed the, the office, has taken the office of Caesar in the name of Christ. And the whole world buys this ridiculous notion today. The very basis of the Protestant Reformation was the papacy is that power that replaced the Caesars. It's the one that Paul predicted. Remember, when I was with you, I told you these things, Paul said. And he said, now he that now letteth, or he that now restrains, will restrain until that man of sin has come. When he's taken out of the way, then that man of sin will stand up. That's when the Caesars left Rome and set up their offices in Constantinople at the time, and the papacy was left in its place. And there arose the, the, the so-called Holy Roman Empire. And the persecution that the ancient pagan Roman Caesars instituted against Bible-believing Christianity, we are all aware of the, of the history of the, the Colosseums, and that in Rome, where they where they threw uh, true Bible believing Christians to the lions, was simply doubled or tripled or even quadrupled by the papacy. The papacy has been the persecutor of the saints uh, in excess of anything the pagan Roman Empire ever launched, and we're unaware of it, generally speaking, in the United States today because that history is not included in our history books. Rome is in such control of the education system in this country that people are never taught about the persecutions that the Roman Catholic Church levied, uh, that the papacy levied against true Bible-believing Christians. And that was necessary so that the Protestants could be prodded back into the Roman Catholic Church and under the papacy's authority. That took place at Vatican Council II. And now... These so-called separated brethren who are now in the 
business of becoming Roman Catholic in their teaching and their belief, and if nothing else, becoming <clears throat> subject to the Roman pontiff. In a one-world Christian religion, the Vatican is going ahead and lumping in all the other pagan religions of the world and saying it's all a big one big religion. No matter by whatever name you worship God, we all worship the same God. And that's blasphemy. It's absolute blasphemy. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved but Christ Jesus and him alone. That's the truth. And what we're seeing is the ganging up of all the pagan religions of the world together with the most pagan religion of the world, Roman Catholicism, and the only ones not invited to this global church is true Bible-believing Christianity. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is not invited, nor is his people. The papacy truly is, was, and always will be that man of sin spoken of by Paul and by Daniel and by the prophet John in the book of Revelation. That is true, historical, Bible-believing Protestantism. It's the truth. The Protestant Reformation was a, was a move from heaven. It sought to bring light into the world, but the world has rejected that light and has unified against that light. And those who behold that light, you and me and every Bible-believing Christian on this earth, the whole world is united and organized by the Jesuits as an a, 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 to attack the apple of God's eye. Those who will never bow to any other authority on the earth but the Creator Himself and His Messiah, Jesus Christ the Righteous. It's a global counter-reformation. Jesuit-led and it's approaching its culmination in the world. And Vatican Council II was simply one element of the global, ecumenical, religious attack upon the Word of God and upon His Christ and upon His people. That's what ecumenism is all about. The world has never been more treacherous for Bible-believing Christians than it is right now. Even the dark days of the Dark Ages, when the papacy ruled over the kings of the world with a rod of iron, a rod of Roman iron, and Bible-believing Christians were persecuted and pursued all over the world, no greater time in history has it ever been more treacherous for Bible-believing Christians than it is today? And Islam is simply the change agent that the papacy is using to bring about the destruction of, of national and international sovereignties and distinctness of, of, of cultures. In other words, to form the world into a single community the borders have to be erased, and, the, and, the, and nationalism has to be destroyed. The world has to come together under one leader, according to the papacy, and that will be the papacy. And so now we see this great movement of refugees from, from, uh, from the, uh, the Middle East into the European nations to threaten the national identities to destroy the national identities, to put the world in such a great state of upheaval and terror that they're willing to sue for peace at any price. And the papacy already knows what that peace is going to be, a global religion, a global and social economic system, and uh, uh, one global government. And that can't happen unless the nations are willing to give up their independence. And it makes it a lot easier to give up one's national independence if one has lost its national identity. So we have this mass immigration out of the Middle East of terrorists putting 
Europe in jeopardy, and we also have this mass immigration of of Roman Catholic Mexicans coming into this country to strengthen the Vatican's the Vatican's uh, uh, influence in the United States of America to put Protestantism, the last bastion of Protestantism in the world, is the United States of America. And post Vatican Council II, there's not much Protestantism left. But the Roman Catholic Mexicans that are coming across this country, for many people that don't know, Mexico is almost 100% Roman Catholic. And they're flooding into this country, and our government is, is, is fostering it, is subsidizing it, is paying for it. And it's all to put Bible-believing Protestantism into an extreme minority status so that it has no power. And those who remain steadfast in their Protestantism are going to be persecuted like the world has never seen before. And it's all happening right before our very eyes. Of course, you're never going to hear this, this slant on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. They're all part of the plan. And so are the churches. There aren't but a handful of churches in this country warning about the Vatican's agenda for this country and, and telling it like it is. The evangelical belly churches have been have been coerced into this 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 uh, this move of tolerance and inclusion and well an, a, an extreme compromise an extreme compromise that reaches even the status of the rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so there's no help for God's people hardly in this country except those who have set their face against Antichrist, have set their face against the kings of this earth that, that, that are ruled over by the papacy and are willing to, to sacrifice their own lives to, to warn the rest of the nations what the papacy is up against. We're all led to believe that Islam is the greatest of all evils to be feared in the world. Let me make it perfectly clear. Islam is just the change agent, a proxy warrior for the papacy to put the world into the status that it needs to be in to accept this global religion and this global government. The same use of Islam is the same use the papacy is using of the Mexicans, Roman Catholic Mexicans coming into this country. It's the change, change agent needed to convert the world to the ultimate compromise, which is nothing but the ultimate rejection of Jesus Christ and his truth. There is only but one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, and it's Jesus Christ and him alone. That is the truth, and the Vatican is completely destroying that gospel truth and accepting every religion, and particularly Islam right now, because it is so inflamed as to be the energy needed to be the change agent throughout the world. I went on a little bit long with that, but I think, I hope I said enough to give people the correct impression about all this, Jörg. Well, Back to, to me, it was not it was not long enough, Tom. I like to listen to your explanation because it is absolutely true what you say. And I just want to remind our listeners to go maybe back to the very first uploads I made on Hour of the Truth, where you can see that Tom and I, uh, together with Walt at that time, made an analysis of another paper of Richard Bennett that he wrote that was the Catholic Lutheran Accord, where we... Uh, went into what happened 34 years after the closing of Vatican Council II in 1965, what happened in 1999, when the Worldwide Lutheran Federation signed an agreement with the Roman Catholic Church that the protest was over, because they made what Tom just said is absolutely deadly for every Bible-believing Christian, they made compromises. They compromised their faith, their doctrine, their belief system to come back under the feathers of the Roman Catholic Universal Pagan, Satanic, Diabolic Church. 
and in 2004, just five years after, the Methodist Church Worldwide Federation signed the same paper. You can go to that for the, in the archives of Our But The Truth, the very first three uploads. Tom and I were examining that paper that Richard Bennett wrote on that subject. And it's great to, after a few months now, being back here at another upload on Our Of The Truth to speak again uh, of this paper that Richard Bennett wrote. And I think you cannot elaborate enough on that, Tom, what you just did. It was a very good starting point and maybe... Um, Brett has some ideas on that here. I don't know. Do you have maybe anything to add or your own thoughts on that, Brett? Oh, I agree. I agree. Uh, it's, it's, it is a, a grievous uh, reality that we live in today here in America. And from the pulpit, we are taught as little children uh, the, uh, the diabolical uh, gospel of... Uh, Futurism, unfortunately, and, um, you know, coming here from Minnesota, not far from you, Tom, um, we're, uh, we're very misled, and uh, we make a lot of assumptions, unfortunately, and they're big, huge uh, stumbling blocks, I believe, you know, in just the little bit of time that I have to research the uh the information that you've laid out so so logically on the table tom um in in all of the books that you've been reviewing for the past year that i've been listening to it's just you know my jaw is just continually hitting the floor because of uh just the the multitude of false teaching it's just it is grievous. Well, there's no one. There's no doubt about it. Futurism is a grievous error. Futurism denies the Protestant Reformation. Futurism, the belief in a future Antichrist, a man, a single man that has not come upon the world scene as of yet, that puts the whole world's eyes in search of a future Antichrist simply denies the Protestant Reformation, and it denies that the papacy ever was the Antichrist of the Bible. It's, it, in, it implies that the, proper, the Protestant Reformation was not a move of God, and that the Protestant Reformation was in fact a rebellion against the authorized Christian faith, the faith of Jesus Christ, that is, against the papacy. The belief in futurism is an admission by Protestants. If they believe in futurism, then they admit that the Protestant Reformation was an error, that it was rebellion against the, the authority of the papacy, the legitimate seat of Christ in the world. That's what they claim. Mm -hmm. and, and the Protestants of today don't believe at all what the Protestant Reformers of 1517 believed. They were unanimous in their belief. All of the Protestant Reformers insisted, look no further for Antichrist. We know who he is. He's the papacy and every pope in succession. The office of the papacy is that was and always will be the Antichrist. Look no further for Antichrist. We have found him. He's the persecutor of the saints. He fulfills in detail every prophecy in the Bible of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. And yet today we are taught that the Antichrist is a, a single individual that comes in the future just before Christ's return. Some argue seven years before, three and a half years before. And so they're blind to the machinations of the Antichrist today. They defend the Antichrist today. They ecumenically unite with the Antichrist today. The Protestant churches don't even deserve the name. And I hate to sound so critical, mm -hmm. but I'm only critical where criticism is due. There isn't a Protestant church in this country that deserves the name Protestant. They don't protest the Antichrist. They believe in a future lie. 
-hmm. And so now this whole nation, having lost its Protestant roots, is is just putty in the hands of Antichrist. And that's why today the United States government is waging war across wars across the world to bring about the need for this migration of, of Muslims into the into the in the countries of Europe. If there were a shred of Protestantism left in this country, the people would be in uprising. You're not going to use the United States as a papal proxy warrior to promote his futurist lie. But see, there's no Protestantism in the country. There's no one who's protesting the papacy's control of our government. There's no one who's protesting these anti-Christ. Uh, the United States has literally become a proxy warrior for the papacy. Whatever the Vatican needs to fulfill its phony futurist fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of Daniel 9, chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse 23 through 27, which was fulfilled perfectly and completely by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That's what made him the Messiah. He perfectly fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. He's the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. But now they're looking for a future one to cause sacrifices and oblations to cease. Well, if sacrifices and oblations are going to be made to cease by this future Antichrist, well, then there has to be a modern nation state of Israel. There has to be Jews living in the land. There has to be a temple built, and there has to be the beginning or at least the initiation of animal sacrifices again on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And our Bible plainly tells us that God no longer dwells in temples made with hands, and there is no other sacrifice for, than Christ. The very reason God had the temple destroyed and Jerusalem destroyed in 70 A.D. was to put a period on Daniel's prophecy when Jesus caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease and proved himself to be the Messiah when he gave up his own life, gave up his own life on the cross, and the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom, thus putting a permanent end to animal sacrifices, when God, when the the Israelites rejected Jesus Christ, God put an end to that prophecy 490 years or 70 prophetic year 70 prophetic weeks after that. And 70 A.D. came the destruction of the temple. God no longer de dwells in temples made with hands. Jesus is the sacrifice. Take him or leave him. There's no sacrifice of the mass. There's no animal sacrifices. There's no temple in which to worship the true creator. We now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our sacrifice is Jesus Christ. And that's what Rome hates the most. And that's what the ecumenical United States government hates the most. And that's why they've united with the papacy. That's why the papacy is can count on the United States to fight all the necessary wars in the Middle East to make Jerusalem secure for this future Antichrist to come. And once this hand-picked future Antichrist has come and caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease in the new rebuilt temple in which God does not dwell, and sacrifices which will be a stench in his nostrils, once that one is done out of the way, then the papacy is free to rule the world as the vicar of Christ, which he claims to be. The United States is the most deaf blind and dumb nation on the planet. It had the Protestant Reformation. It knew the truth. And it has forgot it. It has allowed it to be perverted into futurism. And now the whole world expects Daniel 9.27 to be fulfilled again in the future. In abject rejection, <clears throat> in tantamount rejection, that Jesus was the fulfillment of that prophecy. They're literally looking for another Messiah. And it ain't going to be Jesus. It's going to be the man of sin. Mm -hmm. Maybe I went through this a little bit too fast. But if people will listen to First Amendment Radio and Inquisition Update, I make the case undeniable. I make it so simple that anybody can, can understand it. Oh, yes, I agree. Absolutely. The first thing we have to realize is that Daniel's prophecy was about the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah, the first coming of the Messiah. And he didn't even mention the Antichrist. 
It has nothing whatsoever to do with the Antichrist. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The prophecy was about the Messiah and Daniel's people, the Jews, and Jerusalem. And when Jesus come at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel, three and a half years later, he gave his life on the cross. There was another three and a half years of, of, of pleading, the apostles pleading with Jerusalem to accept Jesus. And when they finally stoned Stephen, that ended the 490th year. And Jerusalem was destroyed. Israel was destroyed. The nation, it's never to be built again. Okay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, now we look for a future fulfillment of that. Someone who will cause sacrifices and oblations to cease. What's the purpose of that other than to point to a false Christ? That's what it's all about. The papacy has rejected Jesus Christ and used his name and deceived the whole world. The papacy even claims to be the vicar or the replacement of Jesus Christ. That ought to tell the world something. It surely told the Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformers, everything. They heard all they needed to hear. There's no replacement for Jesus Christ. There's no substitute for him. There's no vicar except for this. Jesus said, well, I must go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go away, the Comforter will come, and he will teach you all things. Was he speaking of the Pope? No, he was speaking of the Holy Spirit. So this is the vicar of Christ. The replacement of Christ is the Holy Spirit. But we have this man, this pompous old pedophile in Rome, wearing a dress and little red shoes with a funky fish head hat on his head, calling himself the vicar of Christ. He's nothing but the manifest blasphemer of the Holy Spirit. There's no there's no forgiveness for him, yet the whole world dances to his tune. And the only light that has ever come into the world after Christ was the Protestant Reformation. The world was steeped in darkness until the Protestant Reformation. Rome hates the Protestant Reformation more than anything because it positively, unmistakably, and perfectly portrays the papacy as the Antichrist and and educated the whole world so that even all of Europe rejected the papacy. And that's where we got the constitutional governments of the world. Before that, there were no constitutions. The Pope was the government of every land. He ruled through the king or the queen. But we got liberty in Christ. We overthrew all those papal governments. We set up constitutional republics that protected the Christian rights of people. No longer could the papacy make us slaves. No longer could the papacy kill us. But now the ecumenical movement, the whole world, is bending the knee to this man of sin in Rome. And there's going to be nothing but bloodshed. And you see it on the news every night. And it's time for the people of this world to know who's the cause of all this bloodshed. It's the papacy that rules over the kings of the earth, just like he did in the dark ages. We don't need to be, dis- we don't need to be ignorant of this. And we all need to be about the business of warning the rest of God's people about it. I said I wasn't going to carry the water tonight, but I guess I just can't put it down. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom, you can't deny your nature. That's what you are, and that's what you are here for. And it's uh, it's very nice that you give this uh, deep explanation, but I have to make a few comments on that to elaborate to our listeners that if they want to know more about that, you know, in the past we did broadcasts, as you probably remember, under the name Nothing But The Truth, The Greatest Deception Since The Garden of Eden. Yes, indeed. And another one uh, that was called The Consequences of Not Knowing The Greatest Deception of the Garden of Eden, called Satan's Paradise. And my listeners can find these broadcasts where you elaborate massively into this historic facts, biblical facts, in the playlist of my YouTube channel on Nothing But The Truth. They can be found there. 
there is another playlist that when you watch that, you will absolutely understand that there is no future Antichrist. That whole right. playlist consists of 11 videos where most of the time Tom was there to explain it and go through a paper that we found on the website of um, presenceofgod.org uh, from Nicholas. And um, that is called Characteristics of Antichrist. These are almost 25 hours full packed of 26 characteristics where you can see who the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist exactly is. So when you think of a future Antichrist, just go through these videos and you will absolutely without any doubt, looking back on history as it has been fulfilled, that the papacy and only the papacy has fulfilled not only these 26 characteristics of Antichrist, but even many, many, many more. Yeah. So when every, you have, whenever you have a doubt, browse through my playlist, find these, or you have a question, post them in the description, uh, post them in the comment section of the video, and I will put the links in there for your research that you can do. And all the videos are linked with links uh, that you provided with links that you can do your own research on that and don't have to believe me. But there you have a start where you can go from. Another thing <clears throat> that I wanted to say. Um, just occurred to me while Tom was speaking and speaking about the Jesuits and how they turned America into the policemen of the world. When you go back to the founding of the Jesuits, which, who were <clears throat> by papal bull ordained in 1540 by Pope Leo III, with the bull Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, which stands for the Church at War, the Militant Church, that is the official title of the Order of the Society of Jesus, or the Jesuits, as they are most of the time called. They are, also Napoleon says that in his biography, they are a military order. And when you go back into history and research the real founding of the United States of America and the Jesuit involvement in there, then you know that America was founded as the world military. And when you look around today in 2016, what are they else but the policemen of the world? They have military stations all over the world. In almost every country, if not in every country of the world, there is a military post of the United States of America. A Jesuit-led country, most and for all, through Georgetown University, founded by John Carroll in 1789. Georgetown was then a boys' school and is today the greatest, well, I don't like the word greatest on that behalf, but it is the greatest Jesuit school over the United States of America, putting out people in politics, people in media, uh, in the film industry, and all through the media and all through politics in high places. This is what the Jesuits do. And because they have America by the neck, almost from the beginning, let's say, that's why you can see that America today is the military of the world. And they are over every, they are just everywhere. By the way, Yerk, I'm glad you corrected me. I think I, I might be mistaken. Yeah, you I said 1773. Yeah. The Jesuits were created in 1773. Yeah. That was an error. Yeah, I know. I just As you said, 1540 that. A.D. Yeah. They were created by a papal bull, Pope Paul the Third, I believe it was. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much for correcting me. Well, that's okay, Tom. And in 1773, the uh, yes. Pope Clement the Fourteenth was the one with another bull. Yes. So-called banishing, uh, yeah. uh, abolishing the Jesuits, but that was all, and you will understand that when you read the book Rulers of Evil, or follow my reading that I did on my YouTube channel on that, of the book Rulers of Evil, yes. and you can see it was all planned. It was to take the Society of Jesus out of the Roman Catholic Church and to secularize them. Yeah. And by that, they had the possibility, even more than before, to disguise themselves as architects, as politicians, as 
I don't know, what, what, artists, what, whatever job they wanted to do, you couldn't even tell if they're Jesuit or not anymore because mm -hmm. they were secularized. And when yeah. they achieved that in the next 40 years, in 1814, another pope, Innocent VII, I think was it, if I'm not mistaken, re-established the Jesuits and wrote in his bull that they were now there forever and whoever wanted to abolish them again should burn in hell forever, something like that is in the bull written. It was yeah. just a masterpiece of deception, because you have to understand, dear listeners, the Jesuits are the masters of deception. They yeah. are all possessed by the fallen angels that followed Satan, that followed Lucifer when he was cast out of heaven. They all have that spirit in them. Mm -hmm. Just just one more word to your listeners, if I may, just to make sure I haven't sure. confused anybody. <clears throat> Everybody knows or should know, and shame on you if you don't, the Protestant Reformation officially got its start in 1517. 1517 began the Protestant Reformation with, with uh, Martin Luther signing his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church, protesting the Antichrist of Rome. And the Jesuits were created a mere 25 years later to defeat, their purpose of their creation was to defeat the Protestant Reformation. And it came immediately after the Protestant Reformation began. It was not 1773, as I said erroneously earlier. It was 1540. So there, I hope I've mended my error. Yeah, okay. And if we are throwing dates around here, the Protestant Reformation really got started in, in 1529 at the Concile of Spire, yeah. where the German nobility protested the note from, uh, I think it was Charles V, who was the emperor at that time in the Holy Roman Empire. And the word Protestantism and Protestants for the very first time came up in 1529. The Jesuit order was building up to be formed in 1534, because that was the year when Ignatius Loyola and six of his companions took the vows in uh, Notre Dame, the church in Paris that was built by the Knights Templars, and they took their vow in 1534, and then it took until 1540, until Pope Leo III put out the bill, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, to really establish the Society of Jesus as another so-called order, but not a monastic order like all the others, Benedicts and all that stuff, into the Roman Catholic Church, and they were officially launched from 1540. And then, in 1542, they could agree to the terms that were set for them to take over the Inquisition, and three years later, they founded the diabolical Council of Trent, yes. that for 18 years was there to fight the Protestant Reformation. Yeah. And I will not go any deeper into that because I've just finished the first of 17 pages of the newsletter of Richard Bennett, otherwise we are here still tomorrow. <laughs> But I want to tell you, the Council of Trent mm. in, the 17th se in the 17th session is very, very important. And when you want to learn about that, go to my videos on, I think it was uh, an hour of the truth that we did that. Um, and it was about why didn't the reformers go all the way? No, that was still nothing but the truth. Um, why didn't the reformers go all the way? The Sabbath question. And you will find a link in there from the Archbishop of Reggio who came up and told the Protestants that they claim to be on the belief system of the scripture only, sola scriptura, but on the other hand, they adhered to Sunday as their holy day. For that there is no, said the Archbishop of Reggio, no other claim than the Roman Catholic Church that made that. And that was what split also the Reformation up a little bit, and that is why they didn't go all the way. And you can all find that back in the diabolical Council of Trent between 1545 and 1563. And then, 400 years after that council closed, you have Vatican II, <clears throat> 1962 to 1965, and the start of the ecumenical movement and the charismatic movement within the Roman Catholic Church and all that BS that we have to deal with today. Yeah.
But without any further delay, I want to continue a little bit in reading this fantastic newsletter from Richard Bennett that gives us so much inspiration to talk about all the things concerning the Reformation and true Bible Christianity. The Roman Church has been consistently encouraging a massive influx of Muslims into Europe, even into the USA. Such immigration is a basic cause for the attacks that have already taken place. For example, there was the massacre in Paris on Friday, listen well, November 13th, 2015. The 13th of the month. Very interesting. Today we have the 13th of March 2016. This is the third year jubilee of the pontificate of Antichrist Jorge Borgoglio, also known as Pope Francis. And I'm glad that we do this on this day because we are doing this in protest of his pontificate. And in Paris on Friday, November 13th, 2015, we had that massacre, which we are going into a little bit deeper in the next sentence. But remember another Friday the 13th, the Friday the 13th of 1307 AD, the arrestation of the Knights Templars all throughout France. Do you think it is a coincidence that an ISIS attack an Islamic attack in the football stadium in Paris where Germany, a Protestant nation, and France were playing a football game that at exact that moment on also Friday, November the 13th, there is this attack when you know that the Knights Templars had been arrested in 1307 on Friday the 13th. I think this is just what they call Kabbalah. Any comments from you guys? I agree. We every, everyone knows that knows anything about the Roman Catholic Church. Their liturgical calendar commemorates all these specific dates. And uh, uh, most of the pagan religions of the world do the same thing. And uh, the 13th of the month is always a time of disaster for the Roman uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, they've got uh, some fetish that they commemorate other atrocities that they've committed by repeating atrocities on those same dates. And uh, it's just one of their calling cards. That's how they put their stamp of ownership and control on, on these events. Very good point, Tom. Absolutely. <clears throat> so you have to know that during this attack, this massacre in Paris, during which at least 128 people were killed and for which the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, meaning ISIS, has claimed responsibility. For that, I will put you a link into the description box of this video from CNN, where you can read about the Paris shooting, and a video where... Uh, I think it is on uh, MSNBC or some channel like that, you will see that ISIS claimed complete responsibility for that terrorist attack in the city of Paris, Friday, November 13th, 2015. Incidents of Islamic terror, uh, Richard Bennett continues in his newsletter here, such as the Paris attack or the San Bernardino attack in the United States of America, are driven by vile totalitarian ideology. Islam has its own dynamic, and it is not based on any logical or rational grievances. Its totalitarian ideological roots are grounded in the Quran. It cannot be doubted that the Pope and his advisers know this. The current exportation of Islamists to Europe was in planning at least since the 2011 uh, since 2011 as the so-called Clarion Project. Challenging Islamic extremism stated ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi stated, quote, loud and clear that if ISIS cannot defeat the West by military means, they will overrun it with jihadists, unquote. The present predicament indicates without any shadow of doubt that al-Baghdadi is on the ascent. The Islamic State may have occupied vast tracts of land in Iraq and Syria over the past 15 months or so, 
but that victory diminishes into insignificance in comparison to what he is up to now. He, meaning al-Baghdadi, has stretched his hand to grab the crown jewel of humanity, European civilization, along with the hundreds of thousands of migrants from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and other parts of the Islamic State Caliphate that have landed on European shores are large numbers of Islamic State jihadis mingled among them. With more millions on the march, trekking across the continents of Africa and Asia, heading towards Europe, there is evidence that al-Baghdadi had the financial backing of rich Arab states, in particular Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Well, Saudi Arabia also played a very important role in financing 9-11 and was always working together with the Bush family, Skull and Bones family. But I think deviating into that would really go a little bit too far. And while Europe's leaders talk and talk and talk and talk, their countries are gradually being inundated with migrants and jihadists exactly as planned by the modern-day caliph. Now we have a look into the autumn 2015 events. In Germany, which has three to three and a half million Muslims, and I think that is a very, very low estimate, a Roman cardinal spoke of Islam's Quran as part of the historic heritage of Europe and the Near East. Quote, the cardinal was cardinal and bishop of Mainz. You remember Mainz, where Martin Luther went to defend his faith in 1520, before the emperor? There the German cardinal sits, who emphasized before 250 listeners at the event center of the university that the interreligious dialogue has a long history and started at Vatican II. Now listen. Then Cardinal Lehmann, or Lehmann, the German cardinal, stated that Quran research shows ways to read the Quran as a text of late antiquity. As a result, the Quran does all at once not appear strange, but shows the nearness to Christendom and Judaism. The Quran in other is words, Catholicism and Judaism. <laughs> Christendom <laughs> reads Catholicism. Thank yes, you, Tom. Indeed. I should have marked that down. You're absolutely right. The Quran is part of the historic heritage of Europe and the Near East, says the Cardinal. Well, really? Did you know that the German President Gauck and the German Chancellor Merkel both, by the way, from the former Communist German Democratic Republic, the DDR or GDR, have repeatedly stated, quote, the Islam belongs to Germany. Now, let me ask you a question. How about if President Obama or another Jesuit puppet of importance dare to say the same thing of the United States? We are not Muslims responsible for the outbreak of the quote-unquote war on terror after 19 camel jockeys flew two airplanes into the World Trade Center towers, turning three towers to dust by just two planes? Has America already forgotten that Islam was blamed for this attack? So when Islam also belongs to America, does that not throw a new light on the phrase that 9-11 was an inside job? That's now, what America yeah. belongs to. America belongs to Roman Catholicism, and they're putting all the emphasis on Islam to protect the papacy. That's what they're doing. Absolutely. Now, here's a German article that you can read. I will put that also in the description box of the video. It's from Ruhr Nachrichten. It's in German. Here's a German article included in the newsletter that states Cardinal Lehmann wants to encourage interreligious dialogue with Islam. And all the links of the newsletter will be provided in the description box of the video for your own research. I continue reading in the newsletter now. Maybe question, Tom has Gert. a comment Let for me, uh, can I ask you and your listeners a question? Yeah, of course. 
should the body of Christ, those who are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and owe their salvation to him and his sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago, should they seek any kind of dialogue with Islam? They shouldn't search any kind of dialogue with anyone but Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus told the Jew, told us all, come out from among them, ye people. Be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Where is interreligious dialogue in that statement? Nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Interreligious dialogue is just another cover for global religionism, global paganism under the headship of the papacy. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, saith Christ the Lord. That's the right position for true Bible-believing Christians. The body of Christ touches not the unclean thing. That's where we need to be corrected. They've made interreligious dialogue a buzzword that is repeated by even Bible-believing Christians. They get us to speak in their direction so that they can lead us in that direction when we know it's against the Scripture. So if you're finding yourself repeating that, that, that word, interreligious dialogue or ecumenism, you're simply becoming a tool for them and not for Christ. Back to you, Yerk. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Maybe Brett has a thought on this? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, it's my mic. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking along the same lines of, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but um, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, just interrupt me when you're back on your train of thoughts. No problem. <laughs> I will just keep on reading a little bit. I still have a few pages to go. But such is the dreadful compromise carried out in Germany. Never mind the truth that the Quran is not part of the historic heritage of Europe, as the Cardinal himself knows. Rather, the Roman Catholic agenda is again to, streng is again to strengthen its influence across the world. Comment. Please. Yes, so uh, I was thinking of just, you know, what Tom was just saying, you know, the the uh, interreligious dialogue term, the you know, I think of it as spirituality also as a a way to um, take the self and replace the self, you know, and choose what Bible verses you want to obey and ones you want to ignore or to to, you know, and this is the thing, it's it's high mindedness to me, just high minded arrogance of 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 a any christian really i i must admit that i was in that position at one time too that i just was very confused you know and um i'm just very grateful for for people like tom press and inquisition update to simplify things a bit yeah, you know, the difference between Tom, Fress, between Tom Fress and the Roman Catholic Church is he doesn't use any sophistry or casuistry, but they are the masters of casuistry and sophistry. Mm. And also Richard Bennett can very well look through this, and this is why he wrote, uh, among others, of course, this, uh, this newsletter to tell us that everything that we read, like this interreligious dialogue, is, not, not, is just another word for ecumenical movement. So they've had this ecumenical movement since the end of uh, Vatican II. That's for 50 years. Now this word is dead. Now we need another word. Okay, just use interreligious dialogue. And the people will not know that we are talking about the same thing. That has only one goal. For all the so-called other denominations or for all the so-called other religious belief systems to compromise their belief system that it fits the Roman Catholic universal satanic diabolical agenda. Yeah, Tom. Absolutely. You've hit it right on the head. Thanks. So I keep on reading in the newsletter again. Another tactic, the support for both legal and illegal immigration 
has for many years been the policy of the papacy. Thus, on September 16, 2015, Pope Francis addressed, addressed legal and illegal immigrants in Spanish at Philadelphia's Independence Hall, saying, quote, The Quakers who founded Philadelphia were inspired by a profound evangelical sense of the dignity of each individual and the ideal of a community united by brotherly love. This conviction led them to found a colony which would be a haven of religious freedom and tolerance. I shiver when I read the words religious freedom and tolerance. Well, let me say something about the Quakers. Mm -hmm. They protested the Antichrist. They protested the papacy. And, and maybe in error in a few things here and there. But they knew who the Antichrist was. And here this Antichrist, Pope, Pope uh, Francis I, is using them as though he had some respect for what they believed. And that he must do in a Protestant nation if he is going to continue to deceive anyone. This is, uh, this is just disgusting that he would, that he would invoke the Quakers when they were, they were opposed to Antichrist. If the Quakers had a voice today, they would reject Francis I making any comment on their behalf or trying to characterize them in any way. So, this is just absurd. But the papacy gets by with absurdity. It, as much as absurd as it is to say that Germany belongs to Islam. Germany was the seat of the Protestant Reformation. The Islam belongs to Germany. That way or around. Islam belongs to Germany, <laughs> one, one way or the other, means yeah. the same thing. <laughs> the, but you know what the Bible says? This is our God speaking. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. The earth is mine. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. That's what God said with his own mouth. The God we profess, the God we worship, the God we believe. But this man, this man of sin, suggests otherwise, that part of this world, Germany, belongs to Islam, or Islam belongs to Germany. Is he not the Antichrist? He cares nothing for the Scripture. The Scriptures oppose him and his church and its whole history. The United States belongs to Christ. This is his, his inheritance. It's in abject rebellion right now, but that rebellion is only going to last until Christ comes. And then the kingdom will be his, and it will be given to the saints, and they will, they will possess it forever. That's our heritage. That's our promise from our Messiah. This creation will be our inheritance, joint heirs with Christ. It is we who would decide who this world belongs to and by whom this world will be ruled, not the papacy and not the governments of the world over which he rules. Back to you, Yerk. Okay, thank you, Tim, for elaborating that. That sense of fraternal concern, Richard Bennett continues in his newsletter, for the dignity of all, from the Quakers inside there in Philadelphia at that time, especially the weak and the vulnerable, became an essential part of the American spirit. He also said, quote, You should never be ashamed of your, listen, traditions. Do not forget the lessons you learned from your elders which are something you can bring to enrich the life of this American land. And you can read that on the abcnews.go.com webpage 
and the link will be included in the description box of the video as I said earlier. Consequently, with this papal mindset, very important, this papal mindset, it is becoming apparent that the Pope and Roman Catholicism are promoting the immigration, both legal and illegal, of Islamic people as refugees into Western nations. Thus, it is reported on a Roman Catholic website, quote, Syrians have left their homes and four million have fled their country as a result of the civil war and the rise of ISIS within the borders. Who is responsible for the rise of ISIS? Huh? CIA. CIA. Catholics Vatican. in action. Huh? You better believe it. Catholics yeah. in action. Absolutely. The Jesuits. The, the United States is the financier of all this. The, all of this terror. Absolutely. Yeah. And the CIA is always represented on the top by a knight of Malta. While the majority of these refugees have fled to neighboring countries, some have sought asylum in Europe. Some? Hmm. Pope Francis and the Catholic bishops have called on the U.S. and international governments to support the asylum seekers. Now I have to make a little comment here. There is an article that you can read where that is written down, what I've just read, in the Society of Mary, USA.org. You can read it for yourself. But in this article you can read that, quote-unquote, climate change is linked to terrorism. Don't miss out on that. I'm going to give you a little excerpt right here. Quote from the article from Society of Mary, USA, by the way, that name alone. Let's the hair in your neck stand up right, right? <laughs> Climate change was casual factor to Syrian situation. A strong link between global warming and human conflict brought a new focus on the trouble in Syria earlier this year, when a study published by the National Academy of Sciences linked a three-year drought between 2006 and 2009 to the violent uprising that began there in 2011. Researchers reported that the cause of the drought stemmed from a, ten, from a trend toward warmer, drier conditions in the eastern Mediterranean, which caused an increase in greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> Sorry. A decrease in the wind that would have normally brought moist air from the Mediterranean to Syria, combined with rising temperatures, resulted in a drying climate and a cycle of more evaporation. Colin P. Kelly, lead author of the study, reports that Syria and the part of the local region known as the Fertile Crescent are vulnerable to the severe drought because of the increased warming of the region. According to a published report in the New York Times, search that out for yourselves, some social scientists and policy makers, probably all Jesuit educated, suggested that the drought had quote-unquote, a catalytic effect on the Syrian unrest, unquote, from the article. Another Roman Catholic website reports, quote, Pope Francis and the Catholic bishops have called on the U.S. government and the international community to provide support to both Syrian refugees fleeing violence and to countries that have been at the forefront of this humanitarian effort. Unquote. As you can read for confirmation on usccb.org news. However, five of the wealthiest Muslim countries have taken in no Syrian refugees. I'm going to repeat that. Listen carefully. Five of the wealthiest Muslim countries have taken in no Syrian refugees. Arguing listen closely, that doing so would open them up to the risk of terrorism. Although the oil-rich countries have handed over aid money, Britain has donated more than Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar combined. Now, I have, to, learn, I have to make a little comment, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> a little comment, and then I give you the floor all the way. From that article, we read, quote, 
total donations from the Gulf states are believed to total 589 million pounds, less than a quarter of America's 2.8 billion pounds and a fraction of the 65 billion they spent on defense in 2012 alone. 65 billion pounds spent on defense alone. The United Kingdom has handed over 920 million pounds so far, but the Prime Minister yesterday pledged, pledged to increase that figure to 1 billion. He also promised to take in thousands more refugees. Unquote. And you can confirm that by going to the website www.breitbart.com and the link, as always, is in the description box. But please, Tom, I want to hear your comment on that. Simply this. Europe, England, a so-called Protestant nation, which James A. Wiley claimed was under the papal aggression, together with the United States and with the cooperation of the richest Muslim nations in the world, are financing this global mass migration of terrorism into Europe and the United States and everywhere else they're needed to form, to, to become the change agents that the Vatican needs to break down national and international boundaries and prepare the world for a global government. We're paying for Let me say it again because I'm sure it goes over the heads of people. It's, it's too likely to, too unlikely to be true, but I'll say it again anyway because it is true. Great Britain is controlled by the Vatican. London proper, the square mile called London, is the Vatican's bankers, the Vatican's global bankers, run the by crown. the Rothschilds. The, run by the crown, the Templars. Run by the crown, they call it. Like, you don't dare call it the Vatican banks, okay? But that's what they are. The papal aggression that James Aiken Wiley was talking about has come full circle. Great Britain, that used to be Protestant, has seemingly maintains its Protestant face, but it is wholly run and operated by the Vatican. And it is Great Britain and Protestant USA, which is now controlled by the Vatican, together with the cooperative nations of Europe, and with the cooperation of the richest Muslim nations in the world, including Saudi Arabia, are financing this mass immigration. They're all in it together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's so unlikely as to be unbelievable, and that's the glory of it. <laughs> the world is not going to catch on because it's a conspiracy so vast that it cannot possibly be true. Who would pay but for their is. own downfall, Tom? Who would pay for their own downfall <laughs> if they knew it? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But we are here in Europe, our tax to oblivion, especially in this little shit country that I'm living in. Sorry that's for right. my choice of words, Belgium. <laughs> where we have one of the highest tax rates all over Europe, and we are now, paying for this BS. You now, I was listening to one of your previous broadcasts, Yarg, and you were saying that uh, that your your uh, value added tax is what? Twenty one percent. Ah, twenty one percent, and there is a discussion already the last year to lift it up to twenty three, right? Oh. <laughs> Man, that hurts. Oh, yeah, you can be sure of that. Well, it's going to follow yeah. right here in the United States, Brent. Yeah. We just won't get yeah. used to it. Yeah. When, now, when wasn't, I, wasn't the crown the uh, the uh, creator of the uh, Balfour de Declaration, too? Yes. Yeah. 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 The Balfour right. Declaration declared that there ought to be a homeland for the Jews. Well, you have to have a homeland for the Jews, and you have to have Jews living in it if you're going to refulfill Daniel's prophecy. Exactly. If you're going to refulfill the 70th week of Daniel, which Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years ago, you've got to have a nation state of Israel. You've got to have Jews living in the land. That's World War II and Nazism and the persecution of the Jews. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have to have a creation, state of, uh, creation of the nation state of Israel. That's how Roman Catholic America cooperated. Mm-hmm. And and now you've got a nation called Israel with Jews living in the land. What's left? 
you got to have a temple and animal sacrifices. Then you can cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease again, right? That's then right. Then you can herald a new Messiah. Mm-hmm. And it's he's not going to come down out of heaven on a cloud, as the Bible says. He's going to walk in all the way from Rome. Mm. That's what's going to happen. I just feel it in my bones. They've rejected Christ from the very beginning. They've rejected Daniel's prophecy, and they want a new Messiah. They want to refulfill Daniel's prophecy according to their liking, because they hate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ redeemed us and set us free from this tyranny. And here we are, we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of this tyranny. It can only be by our own fault. And what is that fault? We exonerated the papacy when we embraced futurism. Mm -hmm. That's why we are once again made slaves by the papacy. We're financed. You and I go to work every day, Brett, Mm -hmm. to finance Mm -hmm. this futurist lie. Yep, we do. We failed to understand Daniel's prophecy. We failed to see its complete and perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. So now we're left wide open for any and every sort of of deception. And from where does all that deception come? Rome, the Vatican, the papacy. It's in cahoots with the United States government. They've got control of all the churches in this country. There isn't a church that I know of in this land that's telling the truth about what what they're doing together. They wouldn't dare. They'd lose lose their 501c3 tax exemption. I just wanted to say they are all 501c3 tax exempt government agencies. They would never admit in in front of their congregation that the 501c3 guarantees that the pastor of that church cannot tell the whole truth. Of course, mm-hmm. you don't bite the hand that feeds you, do you? That's right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we willingly become slaves once again. Yeah, I like what ignorantly, she said. Ignorantly, possibly. Yeah. Ignorantly, possibly. But nonetheless, we have exonerated the man of sin and the son of perdition, looking for a future one. And now we are subject to every deception that he can bring forward. And the government of the United States is helping it. Because it's run by the Vatican, too. And that's proven... That's not only admitted, but it's boasted by a former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, in his book, <coughs> excuse me, his book, why it's escaped me, the, t- the title of his book is Escape the Global, Global Vatican. Vatican. The Global yeah. Vatican, for pity's yeah. sake. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> I, the title of that book, listen, <laughs> listen carefully, let, let, let your listeners listen carefully to the title of that book. The title of the book gives you the, gives the truth, the global Vatican. Yep, yep. And when you open it up, I have it right in front of me right now. If you want, I can read the, what it says. Absolutely. On the flap. <laughs> From centuries long, uh, excuse me, I can't. What does that say? Prejud- prejudices against Catholic. Catholics in America to the efforts of fascism, communism, and modern terrorist organizations to, quote, break the cross and spill the wine, unquote. This book brings to life the Catholic Church's role in world history, particularly in the realm of diplomacy. Former U.S. Ambassador to the Holy See, Francis Rooney, provides a, comp- excuse me, a comprehensive guide to the remarkable path the Vatican has navigated to the present day and a first-person account of what that path looks and feels like from an American diplomat whose experience let, or excuse me, lent him the ultimate insider's perspective. Part memoir, part historical lesson, the global Vatican captures the braided nature of religious and political power, and the complexities, battles, and future prospects for the relationship between the Holy See and the United States both face challenges old and new, unquote. 
And that who sums it up. those challenges? <laughs> <laughs> the Vatican. Mm. The United States is simply a puppet for the Vatican. Mm -hmm. They've worked hand in hand for a long, long time. That's true. Why? Because Protestantism is dead. Mm -hmm. They don't protest the Pope anymore. They don't even suspect the Pope anymore. They believe in a future Antichrist. All eyes have been diverted away from the papacy and its influence over this once Protestant country. Yeah, so rightfully, as the Bishop of uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries said in that yes. time, then he did that video that Tony Palmer, the protest is over, is yours? And if the protest is over, why do we still have Protestant churches? Yeah. You can check. They're not of Protestant the churches. What are they? They're yeah. Roman Catholic. Yeah. They're Protestant in name only. <laughs> not in practice, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And because of, because of this, this mass deception that has taken place in the so-called Protestant churches, Rome is for, completely free to control, control the government now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, do. they march into Washington, D.C., and they make their demands. They say to the, Congress, to the Congress and to the Senate and to the Supreme Court and to the White House, since Vatican Council II, we not only represent the card-carrying Catholics of this country, which constitute 25% of the population, but we now also carry with us the power and authority of the once Protestant churches who are ecumenically reunited with us. All of Christianity is represented by us, the bishops of Rome. And when Rome walks into Washington, D.C. and slaps her hand down on the table and says, we want this or that legislation passed, you can bet your bippy, if they want to stay in office, they better pass that legislation. Rome controls the United States government lock, stock, and barrel. And what horror does that bode for Protestantism in this country? And the same situation exists in Europe today. Well, we in Europe over here live already in the revived Holy Roman Empire, Tom. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. I will continue now for a few little more sentences, and then we will have a few-minute break, and uh, then we can take a little bathroom break, and then we will go into part two of this broadcast, if that's all right with you. Perfect. Just going to read this little few sentences, and then afterwards we go into the next chapter of the newsletter that is called The Roman Church Promotes Islam in Its Schools. And that will take us a long time to go through that, I fear so. A break is coming up, and that's going to do us some good. But first, I'm going to continue reading the last few sentences. Rather, the author continues, Richard Bennett, in this newsletter from 2015 in December, there is evidence that the ISIS leader al-Baghdadi might have been, listen, might have been partially funded by Saudi Arabia and Qatar, along with three other of the wealthiest Arab nations. Undoubtedly, the Roman Catholic Church is rejecting analytical reasoning so that it can support both sides in the conflict. Is the that... Jesuit calling card <laughs> right there? <laughs> Absolutely, Tom. That was on my tongue too. Control both the sides of the conflict, so that when there is a resolution to conflict, the Roman Catholic Church will be on the winning side. Tell me if Richard Bennett is not intimately and thoroughly familiar with the Jesuit oath. Oh, he is 100%. Because he took the words right out of the Jesuit oath. The Jesuits insist on being the arbiters of both sides in every conflict so that the results of the conflict will benefit the Roman Catholic Church in the end. There you have Richard the perfect... Bennett knows it just as well as you and I do. I'll be right mm -hmm. back. Yeah. There you have the perfect Hegelian dialectic. Thesis, yep. antithesis, and synthesis. And the synthesis is the resolution of the conflict, and the Roman Catholic Church will be on the winning side. Okay, let's take a break for about two minutes, and then we gather again for part two. Okay. <laughs> 